I'll let you in on a secret. Shinra is going to abandon Midgar and build something close to paradise. I was invited to be a part of it. Dawn of a new and improved wall market! I'll be lucky to live another week. So, when this is over, you gonna go on being a merc? That's the plan. Reckon it suits you? Yeah, it does. Used to think you were a little shit with a big attitude and a bigger inferiority complex. Quite possibly the worst person I have ever met. But that was before I figured you out. All this, it ain't you. Deep down, you're a pretty nice guy. Didn't see it when we were kids, but... Don't know about any of that. But kindness is no use on the battlefield. If anything, it's a liability. Hey, no one's asking you to treat Shinra with kid gloves. <sighs> Aerith's up there waiting for us. Then we better get a move on, huh? Ready? Some Shinra ass and save the planet. Goal two, save the girl while kicking Mo Shinra ass and get out. Copy. So yes, I skipped over a whole bunch of things. I really didn't feel it was all that necessary to go and jump through a lot of the side quests because honestly, I think they're a little bit of a distraction. I did. To my knowledge, every single side quest, but, well, it took a long time. It took quite a bit of time, and I feel like it really does sort of grind the story to a halt at a point in which it really shouldn't happen. At the point where Cloud and Tifa and Barrett gotta go up to the plate, they kind of really should go right up there. The Don Corneo stuff, notwithstanding, it, I needed to get through it. Hey, you guys might want to turn around. A friend of ours needs help. It's too dangerous. For you, maybe. This is going to take quite a bit more time, though, than, uh, well, like in every other occasion in this game. The original was much more, uh, let's call it, compressed. You get through a certain section, a dungeon or whatever, pretty quickly. Or the developers of the remake went and made an entire dungeon out of what is essentially just a small part of the game. Like, for example, the climb up to the pillar. In the original game, what you did was you found a wire inside of Wall Market, and you climbed up the wire. Then, after you got to the top of the wire, you ran across from busted railroad tracks, you know, stuff like that. And then you jumped around some stuff, and then you were at the top of the play, and you were immediately at Shinra's HQ. Well, in this game... We have an entire dungeon to get through. There weren't even any battles in the original game during this part. So, there's a lot more here. Something that this does do is give us a better idea of the size and scope of Midgar. In the original game, Midgar was the city that the game took place in. But I never really felt like, and you get this idea just by looking at it, that Midgar is a very large place. Now, looking at this skybox that we're looking at here, Midgar seems huge. I mean, not especially large compared to a real world city, but it definitely does feel much larger, like a this sort of like uh, industrial sprawling and the scope of the city is much, much bigger. The skybox is a little bit awkward though, on a technical level though, because I mean, it, though it's reasonably detailed enough, it lacks any kind of depth and it looks fine until you start moving the camera i mean the playstation 4 there's only so much you could do with it 
So I'll give him a pass on that. But we are going to notice something once we get a little bit higher. We can get a good view of the city. Something a little bit strange, I think. For a game that tried to go bigger in every respect, we'll kind of see that the total damage that happened to Sector 7 seems significantly less than what we were led to believe happened in the original game. I think the cutscene's coming up after this battle, so let's fast forward through it. So that's where we have to climb? What if it comes apart while we're up there? Ah! We've made it through worse, you know. Yeah, no kidding. It's a miracle we haven't been killed a dozen times over by now. It's a dead end. Wonder if this rope belongs to search and rescue. Think we might be able to come up here. Time for the grappling guns. Try to aim for that part of the rope that's hanging there. Don't screw up and fall. By the way, how well you do with this grappling gun will tell us a whole lot about you. <laughs> Just remember, we can't come back down. Are you ready? I think I see a rope hanging off the top there. Too easy. This keeps up. I'm gonna get bored. Kill team. Huh. We can take him. We need to stay on mission. I know. Saving Aerith is our top priority. All right, I was wrong. It's going to be a little bit further up when we get to see the total magnitude of the destruction. But the point I was trying to make, though, is that it doesn't seem like the destruction was quite as significant as it really should be, considering what happened, the entire plate falling down onto the slums. Like, there really shouldn't have been any survivors inside the city. But, I mean, even in the original game, it seemed like total destruction. So, a little bit of difference there. Hunter 2-2! Two -two. Respond, damn it! <sighs> this is Hunter 2-2. Two -two. Just had to put down a few monsters. Over. <sighs> Roger. Freaking avalanche making us put in OT. Probably cowering in the dark somewhere. If you find the shitheads, make them suffer. Two, three out. Listen up! We ain't running, and we ain't hiding! Y'all don't know the meaning of suffering, but you will! Call was over. They're putting a much greater emphasis on Barrett being just a bucket of rage in this game than they did in the original. Of course, in the original you had the opening bombing mission and he has a lot of aggression and animosity with Cloud, representative of the people he's trying to fight against, and he bullies people around and he's aggressive and all that kind of stuff. But after the plate collapsed, his attitude changes a little bit comes a little bit softer. I mean, he's depressed. He's angry when it first happens. But once Marlene, he discovers that she's alive, he sort of doesn't act quite as angry as he does before. In this, though, he's maintaining that. And I think it's a little bit more realistic that he maintains that level of aggression and anger, especially when he's trying to strike back at Shinra here.
What the? It's them! Avalanche! Two, three, this is one, four, we have contact! I guess everybody and their mother knows we're here now. Aerith doesn't have much room to complain about that, you know, considering he tried to, uh... <laughs> he tried to communicate the fact that he was there to them through the radio. It's just a trick that I've seen in a number of games recently where they... saw it a lot in the Resident Evil games that came about more recently. Where you get introduced into a new area, and they don't immediately throw you into a bunch of fights. They give you a little bit of time to explore around before they introduce you to the enemies that you'll be fighting the entire time. So we crawled a little bit up ladders and all that kind of stuff, then ran into a couple of little monsters here and there. But it wasn't really until uh, later on in this dungeon before, like, oh, crap, Shin regards. I'm gonna have to fight them all now. I wonder what the first game to really do that was. Because it was something I only really noticed until more recently and you know, it's probably been something that's been around for a little bit longer than that. You know, I guess maybe I remember that happening in the original Bioshock. There were areas where you crawled into, and then suddenly you were surprised by new monsters. But, you know, don't quote me on that one. Alright, so we're getting a little bit more of an idea of the kind of thing that I was talking about here. The further along we get... Seemingly, the more destruction we should actually be seeing, because it seems like the further away you get from the edge of the plate that collapsed, the more the destruction should have been, you know, total. So, uh, let's fast forward to a battle here. We're starting to get close to what I was talking about, where you have a good view of the destruction of the city. The way that the plate was built, it's very large and it is contiguous from end to end so there aren't any holes it was must have been heavy there's a lot of steel and concrete and such in its construction and it fell what seems to be a really long way now i can't quite remember in the original game how high the plate was although it was jesse did tell you how high the plate was off of the surface but it seems much, much higher, much, much larger scale in this version of the game. And its collapse seemed like it was pretty quick. I mean, it didn't just drift down. I mean, it slammed down. So unless these buildings are like the most well-constructed things in the universe, you know, you probably shouldn't be seeing this much in terms of... Uh, this much in terms of intact structures or anything. In fact, I'm assuming that these buildings that were crawling through were actually a part of the upper plate, not the lower plate. Because I don't they didn't really have any large buildings in the in the slums. Everything was up on the top plate. So this was some kind of an office building, although it looks more like a parking garage from here. And a building goes and collapses like that, but stays surprisingly intact. Of course, they have to make a dungeon out of it, and honestly, if I'm picking holes in the physics of the plate collapsing, perhaps I should be finding a better thing to waste my time on. I mean, look at everything in this game. Nothing is realistic. That's what I had to explain to somebody I was showing this game to. Like, there's, there's nothing realistic about this. I mean... Look at the sword that Cloud is wearing. I mean, that thing would be so heavy you wouldn't be able to lift it or even stick it on your back and carry it, much less swing it around like a weapon. Like, everything's rid ridiculous. And the concept of Midgar itself is a little ridiculous as well because, I mean, it's cool of an idea of a sort of dystopian sci-fi premise. A city above a slum is like the sort of the rich literally living over top of the poor. It doesn't really make any sense. And, I mean, it doesn't make sense in the sense of how do you build something like that. It doesn't seem, like, structurally possible. Oh, look, some more intact structures. 
So yeah, I'm I'm complaining a little bit too much. I really should uh just sit back and enjoy the ride, right? Though now that I'm thinking about it, I guess it was really an obvious thing in the original game, although it was it seemed as though it was less of an emphasis on the sort of class divide, you know, rich versus poor. Oh, see, there you go. We've got a good view of the destruction. The city looks absolutely huge from this perspective. But, and a lot of buildings have fallen over, but they still look more intact than they should. Should just be a big pile of rubble. But anyway, what the hell was I talking about? Class divide. Okay, so the original game did sort of hint at the class divide, you know, the the poor people live down in the slums. Cloud says that Cloud and Barrett have that conversation on the train saying that people really well they could move up to the plate. It's like, well Barrett's like, yeah, well I guess they don't have any money. So it does sort of bring up the class divide, the rich people literally living over top of the poor. But this game this remake sort of messes with that a little bit because you see on the train while they're going on their second bombing mission that there are a number of sort of, I guess, Shinra middle managers that are riding the train, I guess, going into work. And they sort of applaud when the one idiot jumps up and starts sort of defending Shinra and spouting out some kind of a Shinra motto, and the other two applaud him nervously because this giant Mr. T-looking bastard is right up in their face threatening them. And it... <laughs> I guess it's a, an added complication to the whole concept because this guy, in fact, those three Shinra employees, if they are living in the slums, which they would have to be if they... Hey, look. Like, the destruction is right along the line there. <laughs> if they were living in the slums, they must not have been uh, either important enough to Shinra or wealthy enough to uh, live up on the plate. So, if they're on the train, they're living in the slums. If they're living in the slums, they're on the poor side. But they do work for Shinra, like I imagine a lot of the people in the slums end up doing anyway. But... Given the fact that they're wearing suits and all of that, you'd think that they held some kind of um, minor managerial position in the company, or at least were like uh, white collar workers. So you get these people who, as far as you can tell, have some sort of elevated position in the company or something above the sort of rank and file grunt, but they are uh, poor enough that they can't move out of the slums. But they, despite working for Shinra and not really working out for them, I mean, they're still poor, they're still living in the land which is dirty, polluted, full of crime, and living literally beneath the higher people above them. They sort of spout off the Shinra mantras and all the propaganda and all that kind of stuff about a better world and all of that. So despite the fact that it's not working out for them, they kind of believe in the whole thing anyway. And it's sort of like a, a cultish kind of behavior. It's like, a, it's like an Apple fan. <laughs> That's a joke. But, I mean, you see people who... The point I was making was... <laughs> that people who buy a lot of Apple products, even when it doesn't work out for them, or something goes wrong with their phone, like your iPhone is intentionally being slowed down by Apple, supposedly to increase battery life, but really what it's doing is killing performance and forcing you to spend $900 on a new phone. The diehard Apple fans will fail to see that as anything to criticize the company for. It's like a cult. <laughs> oh, someone's gonna put a bomb in my car for that one. Because, you know, that's what cultists would do. Thank you. 
A little bit of a blast from the past here. This looks like the 100 gunner, the boss that you actually fought while escaping the Shinra Tower a little bit later on in the game. Actually, you fought, was it called the 100 gunner or the Hella gunner? Heli gunner? Something like that. You actually, it was a two phased boss fight where you fought the first boss on the elevator going down the Shinra Tower with um, Aerith, uh, Barrett, and uh, Red 13 during the escape. And then the first boss disappears, and then this thing appears second. And actually, it was strangely enough a boss fight that I got stuck on my first time playing through the game. I mean, I was a kid and kind of stupid. I mean, more stupid than I am now. So, for some reason, I couldn't figure out how to beat it, and it took me like three or four tries. Nowadays, I can't even understand how I would lose that fight. But, uh, I did. <laughs> but anyway, this is encountered earlier on in the game. I, I mean, the whole structure of the game and when enemies are fought and stuff does get shuffled around a bit. So they like the design, and they want to have the throwback, the callback to the game, but they did, didn't want to have it in the time, part of the game it was in originally. So, I mean, this is suitable enough. These little details that people aren't, who aren't fans of the original game are just going to completely go over their head. You're not even going to know it's some kind of a reference. But for people who are fans, it does... I mean, it, it does just do something for them. It was totally unnecessary. I mean, you don't have to have this enemy appearing at this point in the game. But they do it anyway, and it and it does help for the, you know, the nostalgia. The necessity of having this vending machine here and the rest point here is kind of a sign that your dungeons are perhaps just too long. Now, I get that there is a kind of a necessity of the length of the dungeons in this game being based on the kind of uh, structure, narrative structure of the original game. This happens, and this happens, and this happens, and there are potentially dungeons at only certain points of the game. So, if the game is going to be 40 hours long, the dungeons have to be rather long. And, that was cutscene. Cloud. Yes, we'll build another bar. Yeah, we will. You'll help too, won't you? For a price. Huh. <sighs> For your dungeons, if you're going to make a 40 hour game, have to be long because you can't simply subdivide them up and have smaller dungeons but more numerous dungeons because the way that the story plays out doesn't really work with that. But the problem is though that the dungeons end up becoming so long that your players can maybe feel a little bit exhausted by them. I mean, uh, another cutscene coming up. <laughs> Run! Oh, run, damn it, run! Move your ass! Shit! Look out! I was getting tired of playing tag anyway. Come on. Oh, something of a mini boss battle. Although it ends up being the same boss. That is the main boss battle, so I don't know if I should really call it a mini-boss, but, you know. 
I don't know what to call anything anymore, do I? Eh, that's, that's sad. You okay? I know, mean, okay, it wasn't really a mini-boss, it was just the first phase of the battle. And they have a lot of these kind of cutscenes in between the different phases. What the hell? Anyway, normally in these games, you want to have only a certain amount of dungeon time. Well, amount of time you're going to spend in a dungeon between the sort of slower moments where storyline can stuff can happen when you're in towns or at the end of dungeons or something like that. And this game can't quite get the balance right, but it's not really the developer's fault, and I expect it to be done much better in the sequel. <laughs> we win again. Not that there was ever any doubt. <laughs> Such a thing is too much excitement. Yeah. And there's still more to come. Guess so. Hope everybody's warmed up. Rolled out the welcome wagon. Gotta say, I can't help but wonder if this is a lost cause. Well, you know, some lost causes are worth fighting for. 